you, there you go, there's the prop that is being recorded. So you will be able to view this session at a later time. Um, it will be posted to the BPK YouTube uh, channel and we'll have our communications assistant um, send out a message for that, uh, uh, where to click to get to that session. Okay, so we will start our slides now. Um, so just a very uh, brief look at the agenda here. We're gonna introduce you to DPK. I'm gonna talk about our three, pro three programs, talk a little bit, little bit about co-op and careers. Um, and we do have a couple student speakers who are going to join us at the end. Um, and then followed by the Q&A that I mentioned. So BPK, as I mentioned, uh, we, this is the Department of Biomedical Physiology and Kinesiology. We do uh, consist of three majors, which I'm gonna go through. Uh, BPK builds on the basic sciences to link uh, the study of human physiology, anatomy, movement, and health. So the first major that I'm going to talk about is kinesiology. Um, so kinesiology is very much about the human structure and function in relation to health and movement. Um, kinesiology, I would say, um, all of our three majors are focused on the human body. Kinesiology focuses more at a, a macroscopic view of the human body, okay? Um, we have an ad uh, additional concentration within kinesiology um, that's called the active health and rehab concentration, okay? So if students are interested in doing things like uh, athletic, therapy, uh, athletic therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, I would recommend the active health and rehab concentration. It is the same degree. The only difference is that there are certain courses that you will do as core courses, whereas if you were in the general major, they would be elective courses. And I'll get to that uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, some of the, pr the professions that people will get into uh, through the kinesiology degree include um, medical doctor, uh, dentist, as I mentioned, physical and occupational therapy, optometry. Additionally, people can work in um, kinesiology settings. Uh, so a kinesiologist um, can work, for example, in a rehab setting. Um, if any of you have been to a physiotherapist before, you'll, uh, you'll know that a physiotherapist um, can create a rehab plan for you. Uh, a kinesiologist would implement that plan with the client, okay? Um, ergonomics is another uh, uh, growing field uh, within kinesiology. Ergonomics involves the design of uh, workstations or tools to fit the human body. Um, additionally, there's health and safety type careers. Um, and I mentioned things in athletics. So we have uh, people that get into strength and conditioning, athletic training, coaching, that sort of thing. Our website, by the way, does have information on all three majors and uh, we do have uh, pages which include career options. So the next um, major that I want to talk about is biomedical physiology. Uh, so this is a great major if you want to get that really solid grounding in biology, chemistry, um, physics, and math, and then intensively um, apply that to the study of the human body, okay? So whereas kinesiology focuses on the, the macro view of the body, uh, biomedical physiology focuses more on the, the microscopic view of the body. Um, so you can think about it as the biology of the body. Um, a lot of uh, our students who take biomedical physiology will get into um, various fields, including health-related fields, so medical doctor, dentist, um, physical and occupational therapy, as well as optometry. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, opportunity for lab work. So, there are many, many research opportunities um, in this department, um, both as an undergrad um, and as a graduate student. Um, another growing field, um, which some students will get into, is pharmaceuticals, uh, pharmaceutical sales. Biotechnology is another very um, rapidly growing industry, especially um, here in Vancouver. Um, and a lot of students uh, who are in this major 
are very interested in research, as I mentioned. So there are research opportunities available to you, even as an undergraduate student. Um, you can do an honors as an undergrad. You can also do directed studies courses, and I'll get into more of that in detail later on in the presentation. And our third major is called behavioral neuroscience, okay? Uh, this is the newest major in our department. Uh, this is a program that's offered jointly by BPK and the Department of Psychology. So it is a very unique combination of the behavioral sciences, which will be covered through psychology, as well as the physiological sciences, um, which is the neuroscience component. Um, there's uh, basically half of the degree is made up of BPK courses and half of the degree is made up of psych courses. Uh, for all of you who here are uh, behavioral neuroscience intended, you will be applying into the program through a process called internal transfer, and that's a process that I'll cover more in the July 8th session. Uh, some of the professions that people are interested in uh, in behavioral neuroscience include the, the health-related fields, um, as well as neuroscience. There are research and, and lab opportunities as well. Um, some students have gotten into um, behavioral inter interventionist type work, working with uh, people with um, autism, as well as mental health work um, and addictions work, ad addictions counseling. So now I'm going to go just a very brief overview of um, what our programs look like in terms of the academic side of things. Uh, so you, I'm going to explain some terms that you may have heard about. Uh, but may not have been sure what exactly those terms mean. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, if you're in kinesiology or, or biomedical physiology, you are in that major, okay? So uh, all of you are currently students in the Faculty of Science. Um, the major is um, what your um, focus of concentration for your coursework is. Um, the major is made up of uh, lower division and upper division courses. Lower division courses refer to any course that is a 100 or 200 level course. So the course number will actually be, uh, for example, BPK 142 uh, would be a, a lower division BPK course. Your lower division courses uh, will be essentially the same. No matter which major you're in, in BPK, you will take uh, 15 core courses from a mix of BPK courses as well as biology, chemistry, math, MBB, physics, and stats. Um, so you will uh, essentially start your first year taking the same courses. Upper division courses um, for your degree will be 45 units. Most classes, most courses at SFU are three, unit, three units each. So that uh, is the equivalent of 15 upper division courses. Those are 300 and 400 level courses. Upper division courses are more specialized and more focused on a particular um, area. So you will find um, once you get to your upper division courses, you'll have more choice. You'll get to pick uh, from a list of courses what you want to take. Um, and hopefully after having done some of your lower division core courses, you will have gained some ideas of what um, upper division courses you want. And of course, that's where um, we can talk more um, in academic advising appointments. Uh, another thing to be aware of is there is an option to do honors. Um, honors is essentially you're doing the same degree, but you would do some additional upper division coursework. And um, there's actually three uh, extra classes that you, you would do as an honors student. You would have a thesis proposal um, then you would have some research that you do based on um, your thesis. And then you would um, complete your, your thesis with a report. Okay? Um, that involves, there is an application to become an honor student. You don't need to worry about that as a first year student. Uh, that's something um, that we can talk, discuss after uh, you've done a couple of years here at SFU. Uh, another term that you may have heard about is uh, WQB. Uh, what are the WQB requirements? So these are just requirements uh, that are required for all SFU students um, as part of your degree. So the W stands for writing. 
Um, so you will do uh, six units of writing courses. Most students will achieve that through doing English courses, which many students uh, need anyways if they're thinking about uh, applying to professional school in the future. Uh, at least one of those upper division courses uh, or writing courses is an upper division, which for students in our majors, um, they will achieve through uh, BPK 304W, which I'll show you in a second when we look through the course planning. Um, the Q stands for quantitative. Your quantitative courses are, are covered as a BPK student through your required courses, so no need to worry about any additional courses there. The last uh, set of courses is, are called breadth courses. Uh, breadth courses allow students to take um, courses in other faculties and other areas of study at SFU. Uh, for kinesiology and biomedical physiology um, students, you will do two social studies, social science historic courses, and two humanities courses. Um, there are uh, a, a list of these courses, which you can find on the SFU website, and I'll, I can provide that list as well. Um, again, some of these, um, the humanities courses are covered by um, your English courses. Um, this is really just an opportunity for you to explore other areas of study at the university. So I really encourage you to take advantage of your elective courses and um, find things that are interesting to you. So there is the option to do a minor. Now this doesn't apply to, to most of you on this, on this, um, in this session because you're all majors. Um, there are only minors in kinesiology and biomedical physiology. There is no minor uh, in behavioral neuroscience. You would typically combine a minor in, in, in uh, kinesiology or biomedical physiology with a major in another faculty um, or another department. Additionally, there is an option to do a double minor program um, so there is something called a, a general science double minor. You still get a bachelor's degree at the end of it. Um, you would just have two minors. So for example, a student could do a kinesiology minor and a minor in um, an arts uh, program. Okay, so on to your first year. And I know this is a question that probably everyone is thinking about because I do get a lot of questions about this. Um, so I'm going to start with some of the, the most common um, kind of questions and, and talk you through this. Um, and this is a, a very common question is what do I take in my first term? So first of all, I'll talk about um, how many courses to take. I generally recommend three to four courses in your first term. Um, this is a big transition for, for you coming, most of you coming directly in from high school into post-secondary. Um, there's a lot of things that will be done differently, obviously, this, uh, this year, especially because the courses are online. Um, the, the best options are uh, to take, I would uh, recommend three science courses as well as one elective. Now, um, the nice thing about SFU is that there is flexibility in the way that your courses can be taken. Uh, SFU operates under what's called a tri-semester system. So there are three terms per year. Uh, courses are often offered um, equally throughout the three different terms. So you can uh, take courses um, with a lot of flexibility. You are able to take a term off if you want. Uh, some students will uh, take a term off for different activities, whether they're working or doing co-op. Um, and you can come back uh, the following term and still pick up most of the courses that you want. Uh, I'm going to show you um, an example of what you can take in your first term. So what I'm going to do is share a browser and hopefully everyone can see this. Is this showing up okay? Okay, so just so everyone, know, what everyone knows, this is a really important page for you to know about. This is the BPK forms and resources page. So we update this page with really important uh, forms uh, and information that you need to know about. Uh, the address is here, but if you need to find it off, off of the main BPK page, 
you can go to the submenu of undergraduate students and then forms and resources. So I'm going to take kinesiology as an example. Uh, many of you here are, are kin majors and we will go down to the bottom here and there's actually a form here called suggested first year enrollment. So I'm going to open that up and there's some information uh, and resources on the first page but I want to I want you to take a look at the second page. And here we have a sample pathway. Uh, so this is an example of courses that you can take in your very first term uh, being fall 2020 for all of you. Uh, so BPK 142 is the fourth, first course uh, that we recommend. That is the intro to BPK course. Um, it is a prerequisite for many of the courses that you're going to need later on in your degree. Uh, Chem 121, so this actually um, is uh, the regular chem course. Um, however, for fall 2020, uh, this course is replaced by chem 120 and 125. And that's just due to um, adjustments that had to be made due to the COVID restrictions. Um, so don't worry if you're not, if you're not seeing chem 121 um, in your my schedule, you are looking for chem 120 and 125 here. And the next course here is Physics 100. Um, for those of you, th in this example, uh, Physics 100 is, is needed for students that didn't take Physics 12. Um, if you have taken Physics 12, then you don't need to do Physics 100. You can uh, jump directly into Physics 101. And you can see the four fourth slot here we left open for an elective course. Um, with this course, you can take uh, any of those breadth electives that you need Students will often take an English course here um, or any other elective that they're interested in. If we move on to term two, um, there are more of the first year science courses uh, that you can take here. Uh, so there's a first year biology course. Um, I wanna make a, a special mention about math. Uh, some of you have asked which math do I take because you'll notice there are three first year math courses that you can take. So we recommend that you specifically take Math 154. Uh, math 154 is calculus for the biological sciences. If you take any of the other math courses, uh, you will be taking a math course with engineering students or uh, physics and math students, um, and that is not a math that you need. You are able to take that course, but the Math 154 course is specialized for biological science students. So that is the one you should take. Okay, so that's our course planner. Um, and if I go back to the forms and resources page, um, you can see here that the other majors are also listed, biomedical physiology and behavioral neuroscience, and they also have suggested first year enrollment um, information. Okay, so something else that actually, um, I'm going to give one more link here that um, you'll want to be aware of. So this is, as I mentioned, a very important page. The other, uh, another very important page I'd like to show you is the GoSFU login, and hopefully you've all seen this if you uh, logged in to GoSFU. Uh, instead of signing in though, I'd like you to take a look at the course uh, catalog. So some students have asked me, how do I know when courses are offered? Um, the second link here is, says browse all courses. If we click on that link, and we'll just wait till it pops up. You can see um, all the courses. We're gonna take BPK 142 as an example. So I'll hit B for BPK. And I'm going to find 142. These are all the BPK courses. If you hit 142 and then click this button that says view class sections, in the drop down menu, you can see um, when this class is offered. Okay, so the next offering, of course, is fall 2020. Um, I unfortunately don't have a roster of courses, course offerings for the next year, so for 2021. However, um, the next best thing that you can do is look at the historical data of when this course has been offered. Uh, so 142, for example, you can see it has been offered um, each of the spring, summer, and fall terms um, for the past decade. And 
that's uh, this course I can tell you is offered every term. Um, so you can see the trend of, of when courses are offered by looking at previous terms. Um, it's not the 100% uh, full safe method, but this is kind of the next best um, way to anticipate when courses are offered. For most of your first and second year courses, um, they are offered almost every term and they follow a very consi consistent pattern. Um, once you get to upper division courses, 300 and 400 level courses, those courses typically will depend on um, one or two different professors that teach them. So for example, if a prof goes on a sabbatical or takes a break for a term, that course may skip one term of offering, um, but then be offered the next term. So keep that in mind for upper division courses. You don't need to worry about that um, so much with lower division courses though. Okay, and one um, slide I, I did want to show people, uh, especially for you first year students, is just this be prepared slide. And this is just, um, uh, we want to give you a heads up of, of a couple important policies that you would, do need to know about um, as students in the department. Uh, we do have something called a continuance GPA policy. Uh, this comes into effect once you've reached 24 units. So that's essentially after uh, eight courses. You must maintain a GPA of 2.5 in your science courses, okay? So all of your science courses um, will be calculated in determining this GPA. If your GPA is below 2.5, you will receive a warning email from the advisor uh, to let you know. And you will uh, have one term in which to raise your, your science GPA uh, to above 2.5. Now there is a GPA calculator on the SFU website if you need to know how to calculate GPA. Additionally, on your advising transcript, um, you can see GPA. Uh, just a note that cumulative GPA, and that's a term you'll, you'll hear often at SFU, cumulative GPA refers to uh, your cumulative GPA in all of your SFU courses. So that's um, not just your science courses, but any uh, courses in other faculties as well. Continuous GPA specifically um, is looking at your GPA on science courses. So just be aware of that. There is also the ability to repeat courses at SFU. If you, if you did poorly on a course, for example, um, and need to repeat it, you are allowed to do that. There is a limit on repeats. Um, you may only repeat any one course uh, once. If you need to repeat it more than once, that does require special permission uh, from the department. And SFU's policy is that you are allowed a total of five repeats in your SFU career. Okay, so now I want to get into a little bit about um, some of the other opportunities for SFU students. Um, of course, your, your SFU career is not just about your courses and your academics. Um, you are um, able to apply to a really great program called POA. Um, this was mentioned in yesterday's session for some of you who, who attended the Faculty of Science session, uh, but COA provides opportunities for students to explore careers um, and really enrich your educational experience. You would typically apply after your first year uh, you have the ability to complete uh, full-time uh, paid work terms that are related to your academic field. Um, I highly recommend co-op, especially for um, students in our programs, which are quite broad. Um, this gives you the opportunity to try, try out a field that you might be interested in, and you can see if you enjoy it or if it's not for you, um, which is both valuable information for, for helping you to to determine what courses you'd like to take in your upper division, as well as helping you to determine what you'd like to do after you graduate, whether it's grad school or applying for jobs or professional school. Um, there's also some really great opportunities to work, not just locally, but nationally um, and internationally. So it's a really, really um, great benefit for your personal life experience, as well as your resume. Um, you'll learn how to do really essential skills like cover letters, resumes, interviewing, um, and another kind of soft benefit is the networking. 
um, which is extremely important when you get out into the work field to have a good network and have good references to add to your applications. Uh, so speaking of beyond BPK, um, this is another very common question I, I get, especially from, from BPK students, is how do I get into med school, physiotherapy, grad school, um, professional schools, etc. cetera? Um, so most of these opportunities um, will require a bachelor's degree, um, which you will have after you've, you've completed our program. Um, I just want to make a note that um, if you research these, uh, these different schools, you will find that most of them uh, do not specify what your degree is in. So um, the BPK degrees do give you a very good uh, foundation for uh, many of these professional schools. Um, now the, the thing that I recommend students do is you'll, you'll find that there is no one standardized um, set of criteria that every school looks at. So if you have some thoughts about what you'd like to do after your undergraduate degree, I would suggest create a spreadsheet. Uh, and let's say that, for example, that you are interested to apply to um, physiotherapy schools. Um, make a list of the different schools that you are interested in. Uh, so your target schools, what are the schools that you're, you're intending to apply to? And in a column beside each name of the school, um, list the specific admission criteria, okay? So most of these schools will provide that information on their websites. So they'll say things like what courses are required, um, how many units are required. Um, however, not every school looks for the exact same courses. So that's why it's really important to research the schools individually if you don't find that information on the website, I recommend that you reach out, contact directly the admissions department at those schools. Okay. Um, the, uh, the other thing I, I remind students is that most schools nowadays um, have moved to more of a broad-based admission uh, model. So they're not just looking for GPA anymore. Uh, most broad-based admissions uh, means uh, coursework as well as um, non-course related work. So that will be things like volunteer experience, work experience, um, character references, that sort of thing. Um, so it is really important to, to keep that in mind as an undergraduate student um, that you do want to build up your extracurricular activities, um, whether that be through SFU, through co-op, um, through the various um, organizations and clubs that are available here, or through your own volunteer experience outside of school. Uh, and I do want to make a note um, for students uh, interested in, in any of these schools. Um, as I said, typically uh, no, no one degree is uh, required. Additionally, you are not required to do the active health and rehab concentration to get into physiotherapy. You can do that kinesiology major. Okay, and so with that, I'd uh, like to give an opportunity to have a couple of our current students um, who are on the call uh, to share. Um, the first student I'd, I'd like to invite is Brendan Shump. Uh, Brendan is a kinesiology major. Um, he was a, uh, originally a direct admit into the department, and he's come today to share his own experience about uh, coming into SFU, um, specifically transitioning directly into the kinesiology department um, and how his experience has been. So we can welcome Brendan. Oh, uh, thank you, Aiden. Can everyone hear me? Um, yeah, so my name is Brendan. I'm a third year kinesiology student at SFU. And like most of you guys, I came straight out of high school. Um, I graduated in 2018. And I'm sure a lot of you are wondering um, like what my experience was like and how the adjustment was. So I think the biggest thing for me was it took me a while to get used to the class sizes, especially going from high school where you, know, you have 30 kids in one class and that's like the maximum size to having you know, 500 plus kids in one class. Um, there's just not as much one-on-one -on -one time and you have a lot of things going on around you. So it's, 
I found it um, kind of hard to focus in uh, lectures, but you get used to it after a while. And um, yeah, and also the speed of the classes is a lot different. Uh, one, I would say one lecture in university is probably equivalent to about one week or one and a half weeks in, in high school. So it's just, it's a faster pace that I wasn't used to and it took me a while to get used to. Um, another thing that I wish I was told when I was entering uh, university is just the amount of assignments, especially in your first uh, one to two years when you're taking your science courses like chem, math, physics, and biology. Um, you're going to have weekly assignments for chem, which is online, uh, physics, which is online and uh, written, math, which is online and written as well, and you have labs for chemistry and biology um, as well. So uh, also keep that in mind. Um, but my experience overall so far has been really positive. I've made a lot of friends and the resources that uh, SFU offers is they're great, uh, especially with the BPK program, we have resources like Aiden, who is available every semester to uh, for BPK academic advising. And in terms of extracurricular activities, I also am in co-op, like Aiden mentioned, it's a great program to just get involved with the school and gain experience uh, with different uh, employers and stuff like that, and to gain connections like Aiden has said. Um, other things you can do, there is club days every single semester, obviously not in the fall, because we uh, won't be attending school. Uh, you can also like try uh, working on campus, for example, at the bookstore is another way to get involved. Just like throughout your degree, as you meet people, you'll be able to get more involved that way. Um, and my guess, my biggest piece of advice uh, to end this off would be to go to office hours. I would have saved myself a lot of trouble if I just went to office hours instead of being stubborn and go to your all to your tutorials. They are a lifesaver. I would say the majority of the learning I did was in uh, the tutorials just because it's a smaller class setting you get more one-on-one -on -one time. And uh, make a lot of friends in your classes because just in case you miss something, uh, you'll be able to uh, catch up. So yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Brendan. We really appreciate you joining us and sharing your insights. Um, I want to echo what Brendan said in terms of, um, he mentioned one of his strategies for success was uh, reaching out early to resources. Um, this, this upcoming term obviously will be a little bit different in, in the way that you reach out but there are still ways to reach out um, and interact with your, not only your professors, um, but the TAs, the teaching assistants and other students in the classes. Uh, there will be opportunities um, through Canvas, um, through other kind of online forums. Um, your instructors will um, give you information on how that's done for their particular course. Um, but we, in general, recommend reach out for help whenever you feel that you need it and reach out early. So the next student that we have uh, is Nicole Whittle. Uh, Nicole is uh, also one of our um, uh, senior students, um, also very involved um, with the student association. So there is a student association that you uh, can become involved with. Um, and Nicole is gonna share a little bit about her experience, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, the student association. She's also very involved with um, various other groups on campus, um, student related, as well as interacting with um, profs. So if Nicole is here, we'd like to welcome Nicole. Uh, I saw Nicole earlier. I think she may have had an internet blip because she's not on the list currently. Nicole, if you are here and it has a different screen name, please just send me a chat. Uh, but for now, let's see if she's able to sign back on. You know, technology can be a little bit fussy, our apologies, uh, but I will pass it back to Aiden and hopefully Nicole is able to reconnect. Really sorry about that, guys. Okay, so we'll, hopefully Nicole can join us. Um, I'm going to um, ask that uh, our next presenters are, we should have a couple students here from um, the BPK Peer Mentorship Group. Um, so this is another really important resource that um, you can access. Uh, these PPK peer mentors are um, senior students who are available for, for first year students or new students um, to connect with uh, on an uh, individual basis um, and they can provide um, mentorship in terms of academics but as well as student life. Uh, so if there's anyone from the BPK peer mentorship group, um, we would like to welcome you to join us now.
Sorry, my apologies. I will unmute you guys. Hi there. Artie, are you able to unmute yourself? <laughs> you guys hear me now? Oh yeah, you're good. Um, I'm Shreya, this is Artie. We're uh, co-directors of the BPK Peer Mentorship uh, Program. It's a student-driven initiative that's actually affiliated with BPK Student Association. And so essentially what we do is we aim to strengthen the BPK community by connecting first-year students with um, more senior students so that we can have a smoother transition into university. I know it can be an intimidating jump, so we try to make sure that everyone feels uh, supported and our mentors are there to listen refer, guide, and encourage. They're also able to answer any questions you may have um, about what to do throughout your degree. Um, we also host in-between semester events. Um, due to the current situation, we can't really do our bowling usual events, but we try to hold some online fun Zoom activities just so you can meet new people. Um, so let me know if you guys have any questions. I will just leave the BPK Peer Mentorship email in the chat. Um, give that a little copy and feel free to email us if you want to sign up. Great, thank you so much, Artie and Tria. And if you two are, are able to, you can stay on the call. Uh, we are gonna have a Q&A session and uh, there may be some students that have some specific Q&A for you as well. Um, yeah, for sure. Great, thank you. So speaking of um, different resources and contacts, um, of course, um, in addition to myself, uh, we do have other contacts within the faculty and within the department who you would definitely want to, to know about. Um, so Claire Wilson, who you is on this call with me, she's the one that uh, started our session, is our science recruiter. Uh, so she can answer um, questions, uh, particularly for incoming students um, related to getting started at SFU. Um, if you are a, currently a science student, a faculty of science student, um, but not yet in our department. So for example, if your behavioral neuroscience intended, you can access our science faculty of science advisor. Uh, her name is Nadia Williams, and she is a general advisor for the whole faculty. Um, additionally, if you are intending to, um, to enter into BPK or even into science, um, but you're not yet declared, and you are under 60 units, um, there is student, service student services advising that's available to you. Uh, there's a whole team of student services advisors um, that can help. Okay, so now we'd really like to, to welcome any questions that you have um, related to anything that we've talked about today. Um, or if there's uh, other questions that um, you have thought about um, that weren't covered in this presentation, uh, please feel free to type them into the chat. Um, if you have questions of a more personal nature, personal nature um, that you don't feel comfortable asking here, then please email me, uh, bpkadvisor at sfu.ca. There is also a contact page um, on our website um, in which you can enter um, your questions as well. You can as well you can book appointments there. Okay, so we'll, we'll get, get started. started. Um, okay, so, it, fast and curious. <laughs> so it looks like our first question is uh, from Manav. It's uh, for Brett's social sciences and Brett's humanities requirements. Are those supposed to be fulfilled in our first year or in our first term? A great question, Manav. No, you do not have to take those in your first year or your first term. They just need to be done at some point throughout your degree. Great. Another question here from Kyle. Um, could you clarify a bit what's the difference between um, being intended or undeclared? Are those the same or are those different? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question, Kyle. So uh, if you are um, intended uh, or, or undeclared, that means that you're not yet in our department, you're not yet uh, declared major, 
Now for all of you, uh, because I emailed you and I know this audience, um, if you're in kinesiology or biomedical physiology, you are declared into our department. There's no need for you to internally transfer. Um, I, I believe I sent a link in, in the invite to um, your advising transcript, and you can see on your advising transcript what your major is. Um, now the behavioral neuroscience intended students, some of you are on this call. Um, again, I'd like, you to, like to invite you to come to our uh, July 8th session um, in which you will learn about how to declare um, and how to um, uh, internally transfer into the department. Um, there is information on this, by the way, on our website, um, and you can Google uh, BPK internal transfer. Uh, you will typically transfer after your first year. Um, in, in that case, you will become, you will switch from intended to declared, okay? Now, just so you know, uh, being an intended student does not uh, in any way inhibit your ability to do courses here at SFU. Um, you are a faculty of science student, you can do courses. All of the first year science courses are available to you. Um, you need to be declared to do the upper division courses. So the 300, 400 level courses are reserved for declared majors. All right, this next question, I'll actually answer if that's okay, Aiden. Uh, so the question comes from Kimia, although I also had another student uh, privately message me with a similar issue, so I think it might be a bit more widespread. The question is, I've taken physics and pre-calculus 12, but my schedule doesn't validate me when I add physics 101. Uh, why is that? That is indeed odd. So what I would ask is, my schedule is not perfect. It does sometimes make mistakes, and hopefully that's just a glitch. We can um, speak with student services to have fixed. But if you are encountering any issues where you believe you have a prerequisite, but either go SFU or my schedule is saying you don't, please send me an email. Uh, we'll have my email address on the screen at the end uh, as well. And I'd be happy to follow up with the admissions office. Hopefully it's a quick fix, but otherwise we'll ensure that their coordinators look into it. Uh, this next question is from Liam. Will labs also be online and what is happening with those? Yeah, uh, great question, Liam. Um, certain courses have, have had to be adjusted, um, particularly lab courses. Um, they, this varies course to course. Um, so if there's a particular course that you're wondering about, I'd recommend that you reach out to the advisor in the department of the course that you're interested in uh, because they are being done differently this year. Um, and I, I just see the follow up to this one, uh, the Chem 121 example that I mentioned earlier. Uh, yes, you will take Chem 120 and 125 together. Um, that, that is uh, a lecture component plus a lab component. Uh, it will again be done a little bit differently um, because of the restrictions. Um, for all of these courses, um, I'd recommend reach out to the advisor for that department or um, in general, if you have questions about a course um, in a certain department or a certain course, um, look up the course outline or the course syllabus. They should have some information there. If not, you can contact, contact the advisor or the instructor to get more specific information. I'll just quickly expand on that. For our first year classes, uh, the vast, vast, vast majority are entirely online and labs have been adapted to be done online. Uh, something some of our current students who are in classes this summer have shared with me that some of their professors are uh, adapting labs to use materials that people have around the house. <laughs> um, but a lot of the time what our professors are doing is providing the sort of data that students would be gathering in labs. And a lot of the focus has been on data analysis. So it's, it's still really important lab skills, just ones that you can do distanced and while at home. Uh, this next question uh, comes from uh, Kavan. Uh, and it's in regards to prerequisites. It's a little bit long, so I'm going to truncate it. But essentially, if I didn't take a grade 12 version of a course like physics or chemistry, uh, is there any way to meet those prerequisites otherwise? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. So uh, prerequisites, just so everyone knows, um, prerequisites must be done. Uh, prerequisites um, refers to a course that is required in order to take that course. Um, there is another term called co-requisite. If a course is a co-requisite, that course can be done at the same time as the course that you want. Um, 
Now, in regards to high school courses or IB courses or AP courses, that sort of thing, um, I suggest you contact the advisor of the course um, in question. Um, yeah, for a course like physics, for example, if you have not done a grade 12 physics, um, there, in my ex uh, previous example, you can take a different course called Physics 100. Okay, so Physics 100 uh, would fulfill the prereq in order to do Physics 101. Great. Uh, this next question is from Georgia. It's about breadth requirements. Uh, I noticed some courses have both the B Social Sciences and B Humanities label. Would these cover as two different breadth courses or do I still need to take four courses total? Right, thanks Georgia. So if it has breadth social sciences uh, as well as breadth humanities, you have the choice as to what, what to apply that to. Um, it does not uh, cover both. Um, you, you pick um, if it covers the humanities. Um, you, would, you would choose humanities if you already have two social science courses. So you get the choice. And you, you will, by the way, find that there are some courses um, that are are two or three uh, different breadths. Most of them will only cover one breadth. Great, this next question from Gazal is a little bit more career focused. If I was interested in pursuing physiotherapy, should I do a general kinesiology program or more specifically the active health and rehabilitation concentration? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, um, this really depends on the school. Um, I, always meant, I always recommend um, for any of you that are thinking about applying to grad school or professional school, whether it be physiotherapy or, or something else, always go to the source. Um, so research this on, uh, start with the websites for these grad schools. If you can't find the answer, reach out to their admissions department directly. Um, I can tell you for physiotherapy, uh, no, it is not, a, it is not a, a requirement to do the active health and rehab stream. And in fact, it, it usually is not even a requirement to, to do a kin major. Um, however, of course, the, the, the courses um, that are in the active health and rehab uh, concentration are focused on, on that topic. Um, and they would be very useful for, for a degree like a physiotherapy tool or occupational therapy. Um, so students who, who have an interest in that area anyways, I would recommend take the concentration um, because those are the courses that you're going to do anyways and be interested in. Thanks, Aiden. Uh, these next two questions, I think I'll answer real quick, if that's okay. I also realize I keep glancing to the side. Aiden and I are at the opposite ends of a 12-foot table, so we are being very socially distanced. <laughs> um, so this first question from Marcus, if I took Calculus 12 in high school, do I still need to take a first-year math class like Math 154? Yes. Uh, calculus 12 is a great class to prepare you for university, but it is not a transferable course. You don't get university credit, so you do still need to take calculus in university. Um, it's required for every BPK program. Honestly, it's required for pretty much everything in science. Uh, there are some exceptions if you did AP, Advanced Placement Calculus, if that is something your school offered and you achieved a high enough score, or if you did IB, Mathematics, HL, um, if your school offered the IB program. There are some exceptions where students receive transfer credit for uh, first year calculus, but if you took typical calculus 12, that does not cover a university equivalent. Uh, and then this next question from Lucy is, I'm taking physics 12 in summer school online, just confirming that these credits will be added to my transcript, allowing me to take physics at 101. Uh, yes, they will. You'll wanna make sure your online provider follows up and sends a final copy of your uh, grade to the admissions office. It will need to go to them and not an advisor like Aiden or myself. Um, but one thing to note is that if you're not going to be done till the end of the summer, you won't be able to enroll in Physics 101 this July since you haven't finished Physics 12 yet if you're taking it over the summer. So that's just one consideration for you. And then our next question. Oh gosh, I've scrolled just a little too far. Um, this question is from Lynn. Does taking a minor program extend the time it takes to complete your degree? And how do you add a minor to your degree? Pardon me. Yes, thanks Lynn. So yes, it does. Uh, a minor does add, uh, there are additional courses that you take for a minor. Uh, there are less courses for a minor than for a major though. Um, uh, so sometimes we'll, we will have um, students in our department 
who want to supplement their their uh, degree with um, with with an, a study of um, an arts related field or, or something else. Um, I've even had some students do business minors um, along with their kin major because they wanted to have some business experience and perhaps open their own business in the future. Um, so we do encourage people, if you are interested, to, to uh, explore um, options of doing a minor. Um, keep in mind that um, uh, the requirements for a minor will depend on uh, the department that you're applying for. So you'll need to do that research. Um, and typically, I'd say um, start with the website of the, the minor program that you're interested in. Um, and reach out to the advisor in that department um, if you need more information. Um, but yes, it does, it does add time to your degree. Okay, let me just see this next question here. Oh, we have a link from Shreya reminding everyone of BPK Peer Mentorship. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question here about potentially changing programs. If I'm interested in the kinesiology major, but plan to switch into biomedical physiology, is it possible to switch my declared major? Would that happen in my first year or my second year? Yes, you can. Um, you are able to switch um, majors. Um, if you're already in our department, if you're, for example, if you're already a declared kin major, um, there's no need to do internal transfer. Um, you can just alert the advisor that you're interested in switching. Um, as I said before, your first year courses are, are pretty much the same, no matter what major you're in. Um, so I would suggest just get in touch with me later on in your first year if you still feel that you do want to switch. Um, take BPK 142, that's the intro to BPK course, and it's a survey course, it's an introduction to the department, introduction to our field, um, and it'll get, give you a really good idea of, of whether you like kinesiology, for example, or, or whether you want to do something different. Um, and then after that, maybe um, have a discussion with me and we can, we can um, discuss uh, switching you. But yes, it is possible to switch. All right, uh, this next question I'll answer very quick. It's come up from a couple folks. Um, some issues with my schedule about a class appearing unscheduled. Uh, any issues you're encountering with my schedule, please feel free to email me. And we'll have my email up shortly uh, and I'd be happy to liaise with student services. Uh, they're the ones who run my schedule so us here in the faculty unfortunately don't have access to uh, make any changes there but I can certainly get to the bottom of why a class might not be appearing or why prerequisites aren't being filled. Uh, so I do apologize that we can't fix that ourselves but we can certainly get to the bottom of it. Uh, this next question for you Aiden comes from Brielle. And she asks, uh, for your CGPA, is that an average of all courses that must be above a 2.5, or must each individual course be above a 2.5? Right, so CGPAs do refer to average of all courses. Okay, CGPA, as I mentioned, is a cumulative GPA of all of your SFU courses. Um, when we talk about continuance GPA, we're talking about science courses only. Um, and that is an average of all your science courses that must be above 2.5. All right, we still have a couple more minutes that, for her questions here. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, but this question comes from Lucy. Is there a recommended way to plan courses in order to complete lower division requirements? Yeah, absolutely. So I would recommend, um, again, start with the um, suggested first year courses and I, I'm just going to put that put that up on the screen. Um, this is a, a really just a great way to start. Um, in, in order to plan out your courses, I mean um, you will want to as well um, think about um, and I'll just show one, one other um, planner that will be helpful for you to look at and we'll look at the kinesiology um, major again just an ex as an example. Um, this is again is off the BPK forms and resources page. This uh, planner essentially shows you uh, all the courses for your, your degree, okay? The first page is lower division courses and the second page is your upper division courses, okay? At this point, you're only really worried about the first page um, and you're just worried about taking the courses in this left-hand column. Um, if you um, need to take a course, you need to have the prerequisites. So as long as you have a prerequisite, you can take that course. If you don't have the prerequisite, 
then that's the course that you need to add to your schedule in order to get in, into further courses, okay? Um, this um, general kind of layout, again, it, this is just a sample. You do not have to do it this way, but this is one way to complete um, many of your first, uh, first year courses um, in the first three terms. All right, this next question is from Helia, and uh, is she asks, uh, how, or pardon me, they ask, how many English classes do we have to take? I specifically asked about biomedical physiology, but why don't you tell us for everything? Sure, um, so that, yeah, this applies to everyone. Um, there actually isn't a requirement to take um, an English course. You are, however, required to take, as I mentioned, two breadth humanities courses. Uh, English courses, um, most of the English courses will fulfill the breadth humanities course. Therefore, most students will take at least one English course, um, as well as students um, who are planning to apply for professional school or grad school, uh, typically you need English courses as part of your admissions criteria. Um, it is not a requirement though to take that English course. I'm very biased because I love English classes. <laughs> I assume everyone wants to take them, but you don't have to. Uh, this next question comes from Joy. How do IB credits work after course registration? So uh, perhaps I'll tackle this one, Aiden. Uh, so if you're a student who did the full IB diploma and uh, successfully completed your diploma, you do get 30 transferable credits. That's essentially like one full year's worth of transfer credits. Uh, there are some caveats within that uh, that I won't go into on this call, but all of the details are on the admissions page. Um, IB credits should already be assigned. They should be um, on your academic advising transcript if you were to pull it up now. So they should already be there well before course registration. Uh, this next question uh, is also about IB. Uh, I've been told general IB transfer credits such as Math 1XX can't be used to satisfy specific math courses. What is the point of a general credit uh, as opposed to something more specific? So a general credit, like a, a 1xx, for example, still counts towards the total credits you need to graduate. So a whole degree, 120 credits, takes you know, roughly four to five years to finish, depending on your pace and if you're doing co-op and other things. And majors are usually around half of that, I'd say around 70 credits. Aiden, does that sound about right for BPK, 60 to 70 credits? So that leaves almost half of your degree for electives like those WQB requirements, just general credits, maybe doing a minor, which we chatted about earlier, or even a second major. So general elective credits will still help towards the total you need to graduate, even if they can't satisfy a specific requirement. Um, at this Next question, do lower division and upper division requirements have to be completed by the end of our graduate undergraduate program or by the end of our first year? Okay, so um, yes, you will complete them by the end of your program. Um, all of the courses, your lower division and upper division courses are part of your, your program, part of your degree. Uh, you will not be completing them in your first year because you won't have the prereqs to do them, okay? Um, you will need to complete your lower division courses uh, because they are uh, required courses in order to be enrolled in uh, almost all of the upper division courses require uh, lower division prereqs. Uh, so this next question is, if I'm not taking physics or math in my first term, is, is that okay if I say take BPK and chemistry and biology? Is it all right to not be in physics or math this semester? Yes, absolutely it is. Um, and that's the nice thing about uh, SFU. There is some flexibility in the order in which you take courses. Uh, you are not required to take them in your first term. You could take them um, in future terms. Uh, the only thing I recommend here is, is look at when those courses are offered. Um, a lot of first year courses are offered every term, not every first year course is offered every term. Uh, so just make sure, um, again, look at the course catalog that we mentioned earlier uh, to see when that course is offered. Um, you can also reach out to the advisor um, of that particular course um, if you want more information on course offerings or any specifics about that course. Great. Uh, and this next question from Madison, I think I'll answer. Uh, it says, if I don't take chemistry 120 or 125 in my first term, would I be taking those in my second term or would it be chemistry 121? 
Uh, the short answer is we don't know yet. <laughs> uh, we don't know what the spring semester is going to be as far as will it continue to be uh, almost entirely remote learning or will there be more face-to-face -face instruction? Um, recently, the president of the university indicated that they're hoping to make a decision about spring instruction in late summer, early fall. So I hope that by the time we're into September, we have a better idea of what instruction will look like in January. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that question now, but it's definitely top of mind for all of us. So we'll be sure to say that or share that part of me when we have an answer. Uh, also, one of our advisors is in the chat and she uh, gave me a little bit more information about my schedule. So thank you very much, Amelia from Biological Sciences. Uh, she indicated one of the reasons a class might not be showing up on uh, my schedule as, or it might appear as unscheduled is if it is an asynchronous class. So if it doesn't have a specific time slot. So that might be one of the reasons it's not appearing. Um, this next question is a great, perhaps, transition uh, onto the future because it's what time will the behavioral neuroscience session take place? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, it, is, uh, it is July 8th. <laughs> there is a, a, an email invite that we will send out. Um, it'll be in the afternoon. I, I believe it's at 1 o'clock, but I will confirm in the email. Um, we will do a, a very similar session to this one. It'll be Zoom-based. Um, we will send out... Uh, any information that you need to look at beforehand. Um, I will because um, I know that um, for behavioral neuroscience students, one of the main questions that you'll want to know about is what is internal transfer? I know I alluded to it and, and we'll talk about this more in the session, but um, this is the internal transfer uh, page of our website. Um, all the information that you need to know about internal transfer is right here. Um, so you can, um, again, this is off of our website. Um, you can review this before the session if you'd like. Um, internal transfer, by the way, is not something um, that you will do in your first term. Um, you do need to have done a couple uh, terms at SFU before you'll have enough courses for internal transfer. So don't worry about um, you know, needing to apply to internal transfer in the fall or anything like that. Um, you're simply taking courses in the fall, um, just as any of the other BPK students are doing. Um, and many of those courses you're, you're taking are the same. Right. Next, we have a co-op question. Uh, do we get any credits when we do a co-op? Uh, there are credits for co-op, but those credits do not count as ac academic courses towards your, your degree. Uh, Claire mentioned uh, you, get, you need 120 uh, units to graduate from, with your undergraduate degree. Uh, co-op credits do not count uh, towards those 120. Um, however, there is a co-op certificate for students who do uh, at least three co-op um, terms. Uh, the co-op office can answer any questions that you have about co-op. Um, I do suggest you check out their website and, and you can uh, Google BPK co-op. Um, they have their own information sessions every term um, and they're also very responsive to email so you can ask them questions too. And just to add on to that, um, we also have something at SFU called the co-curricular record or the CCR. It's essentially like a transcript with everything you do that's not academic. So if you get involved as a peer mentor, like some of our students you've seen today, if you do co-op, if you go on an exchange, that's keep kept track on your co-curricular record. So there's still a record that you've completed it, but not academic or credit. Uh, this next question is from David. Do I have to take a BPK course in my first term? I didn't take biology 12, so I'm a little anxious about taking a BP BPK course uh, before finishing some biology. Yeah, that's totally fine, David. You do not need to take the BPK course uh, in your first term. Um, you have that flexibility to take it in your second term if you want. Um, if you have any specific questions about a course, um, a particular BPK course, um, as I said, I would recommend um, uh, look at the outline for the course. Um, there is a, uh, SFU has a course outlines page where you can see outlines for every course. Um, if you have specific questions about the course, you uh, can reach out to the instructor. Um, uh, and as well to me, if you have any particular issues about um, your comfort level with taking a particular course, uh, but you do not need to take a BPK course in your first term. These next two questions from Max and Sarah are similar, so I'm going to compound them into one. 
uh, are taking Chemistry 120 and 125 equivalent to taking Chemistry 121? And is Chem 120 and 125 considered one course or two? Um, so, um, yes, they are equivalent. So, uh, again, this is just a special consideration for, for the fall term and perhaps um, uh, any further terms in which um, we have the COVID-related restrictions on campus. Um, so yes, they are uh, equivalent. Uh, those two courses together do equal Chem 121. Um, although Chem 120 and 125 are two separate courses, uh, the number of units that they um, equal is the same as Chem 121. So they will um, be equivalent to four units in the end. I think I'll answer this next one. Uh, is it possible to take a minor in business with a biomedical physiology major? And if so, how can I do that? Uh, and you can take a minor, even a second major, if you're really keen, in pretty much every single other program at SFU. And sometimes we see students with wildly different interests, um, like they might be in BPK, but they're also studying gender studies, and they're also, or they're also studying dance, or they're also studying economics. It, it can be as related or as unrelated as you feel fits. Uh, for minors, you don't apply to them now. You uh, would join them once you're at SFU. It's actually very similar to the internal transfer process Aiden described, where uh, each department has requirements to join the minor. Uh, it's usually taking a handful of courses anywhere from three to eight, depending on the program, uh, that you take those courses. And as long as you're achieving good grades, it's fairly straightforward to add a minor. Uh, there are academic advisors like Aiden, but for every single department. So for business, for example, it's a great idea to connect with their advisors to get a better sense of what the minor entails. I think it's five prerequisite courses, but don't quote me on it because I'm not the business advisor. They are definitely the expert. All right, we're almost caught up on questions here. Um, okay, so this next question, uh, Chemistry 111, which is an introductory course, is not available for fall 2020, but only spring 2021. What do you recommend I take considering that I need to do the introductory courses for chemistry and physics? And I, perhaps I'll expand this to a more general yeah. question about when are courses offered? Uh, if something's not available in a certain semester, what should you do? And just to add on to that, if somebody's finding course planning to be really difficult, what should they do? Yeah, good question. So um, again, I do recommend looking at, and I'm just going to pull it up again, the, um, the course catalog to see when courses are offered. Um, in terms of um, uh, the order in which you take courses, it's really determined by prerequisites. So long as you have the prerequisite, you can take the course, okay? If you don't have the prerequisite, then take that prerequisite course first uh, before taking the course that you need, okay? Um, and as far as uh, doing courses, if you want to take five, um, as I said, I generally don't recommend five for your first term at SFU. Um, I would recommend three or four. Um, if you feel like you must do five, um, take the other courses that you have prerequisites for. As well, you can take um, some of your elective courses. Um, so I mentioned those breadth courses, those can be done um, and that can fill out your schedule. I, I know that some students may uh, just prefer to take more courses or they may have um, you know, a need to be a full-time student for uh, purposes of student loan or um, any scholarship trust funds that they're a part of. Um, but those typically would require um, three to be a full-time student. Um, you do not need to take five um, to be considered full-time. Um, it's totally up to you though. We, we, um, uh, we don't, I don't control that and I don't tell you what to take. Um, I only give recommendations. Uh, and Aiden, perhaps I'll just draw your attention back to one point of that question, which is if someone is having difficulty with their course planning, who's the right person to talk to? Uh, absolutely speak, um, uh, send an email to me, send a, to a, any of your advisors, uh, for anyone that's on this call. Um, course planning is uh, certainly one of the areas that your academic advisor can help with. Um, if you have specific course questions, um, uh, it may be a question for the advisor of that particular course. 
And I'll add to that that uh, Student Services also runs academic advising, which all of you have access to. They even do something called Live Help. It's essentially just like a messenger, online messenger service to chat with advisors, which they're using now more than ever with everybody working from home. And as of course Aiden mentioned, we're all available by email as well. Uh, this next question comes from Lynn. I'm intended for behavioral neuroscience and I have interest in most of the set one courses. Should I still take an elective in my first term? I would like to finish set one courses as soon as possible so I can declare my major. Thanks Lynn. So no need to take an elective then. You can save your elective for a future term um, if you'd like to just focus on your set one courses and getting into uh, the behavioral neuroscience program by internal transfer. Um, that's completely up to you um, and you can do it that way. Uh, elective courses are, are um, meant to be taken at any point in your degree. Um, even as a senior student, if you're in your fourth year, you're still able to take a first year course. Um, you're not restricted um, to taking a course um, in any particular time. The only thing that you need to be aware of, as I mentioned, was prerequisites. That, that is a limiting factor as to when you can take a course. This next question was uh, sent to me privately, so I won't share the person's name, but it is a fantastic question, so I'm going to share it here. Is there a set of pre-approved courses that count as electives? Um, I, I think I can answer this one. There are quite literally thousands of courses <laughs> that count as electives. Um, anything outside your major, honestly, could loosely be called an elective. So uh, there's no list of, oh, you must take an elective from this course, or pardon me, say a list of these 20 to choose from. Um, you have so much flexibility. Uh, Aiden on the screen is just pulling up the WQB requirements. And there are links from here that will show you every single course that's designated as breadth humanities or every single course that's designated as writing, whatever the case may be. Um, so as you can see, lots and lots and lots to choose from. So there is no pre-approved list. We want you to have a lot of flexibility with electives like the WQB requirements because, you know, somebody mentioned earlier, do I have to take an English course, for example. Not everybody loves English classes as much as I love English classes, but you might look at another subject like resource and environmental management, be super passionate about that. And that might be an elective that's much more up your alley. So you have a lot of flexibility with electives on purpose. I do believe, I think we're all caught up on the questions. <laughs> uh, so perhaps I'll, I'll give it just one moment if anybody wants to sneak one in at the end. I know we've already kept you in the session for a very long time. Alrighty, well, uh, Aiden, if you'd like to return to the last screen, it'll show my contact information uh, and it'll have Aiden's contact information as well. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us at our peak. We had 93 people here in the session, which is more than we ever expected when we were planning this. We thought like, yeah, like you know, 30 or so would be like a really great number. We'd be so happy with 30 and to get to chat with almost 100 of you is spectacular. Uh, I'd particularly like to thank the students who joined us today, our current students, to speak about their experiences, uh, as well as, of course, Aiden, your advisor extraordinaire, and Andrew, behind the scenes, who you can't see but is here and is incredibly helpful and important and does a lot for you, too. You get a lot of emails from him. So thank you all so much for joining us. Ooh, one last question under the, under the wire. How do we make an advising appointment? Yes, thank you. So that's a, a great way to segue out is uh, there, there is an advising um, page on the BPK website uh, that also has an appointment booker. So you can um, not only ask questions on that website, but you can book an appointment uh, with myself. Um, all, of, all the other advisors, uh, departmental advisors at SFU have their own booking system, but uh, this is how uh, BPK advising um, books appointments. Uh, so there's a calendar, booking calendar, and you can book a 20 minute time slot uh, to speak with me. We please leave your phone number uh, and I will call you um, at the assigned time. If we need to look at something or share a screen or anything like that, then we can set up a Zoom chat, but otherwise it'll all be on phone. So, thank, thank you very, you very much. much. So we really appreciate all of you joining us um, and we're excited to have you come join us here at SFU specifically. Um, here in the BPK department and in the, in the faculty of science. Uh, it's a very exciting time for you. 
uh, and we encourage you again, please do not hesitate to reach out anytime you have questions. Um, that is probably one of the keys to success as a student. Uh, identify when you need help and reach out for us. And we're here for you. So thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe, and uh, we look forward to talking with you soon.